The Libya Contact Group meets in Doha to consider a political solution in Libya, even as the military action on the ground continues. Can more talks make a difference in breaking the deadlock? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Taymour Nabili. Arab and Western leaders met Libyan rebels in Doha on Wednesday as part of a Libya contact group that was set up last month. Now, the delegates debated the issue of NATO's role, recent peace initiatives, and the possibility of arming Libya's rebels. And as Sonia Gallega reports, it all took place amid continuing military action and fears of a deepening humanitarian crisis in Misrata. Seeking an end to the Libyan crisis, Arab and Western leaders arriving in Doha for an active day of talks, upping the diplomatic push to end the conflict. For the opposition Transitional National Council, the TNC, it's an opportunity that comes with one condition. We are with the peace, we'd like to have a peaceful solution, but we have a pre-request for this, any initiatives, and that request that al-Gaddafi and his uh, family leaves the country. The battle between Gaddafi's troops and opposition forces is deadlocked and there have been complaints that NATO is simply not doing enough to protect Libyan civilians. For the TNC, the aim of Wednesday's meeting to get international recognition and break the stalemate of the current crisis. The key players at that meeting, Qatar's Prime Minister Sheikh Hamad bin Jassim bin Jabal Al Thani. Qatar is one of three countries along with France and Italy that has officially recognized the council. Co-chairing is the UK's Foreign Minister, William Hague. Mr. Hague has urged NATO to increase its missions if it is to succeed. German Foreign Minister Guido Westerwelle is also attending. Germany plays no military role in the operation and backs only humanitarian efforts in Libya. And Libya's former Foreign Minister, Moussa Kousa, will make an appearance. He's been free to attend after British authorities questioned him about the Lockerbie bombing. But he's being viewed with some suspicion by the TNC. While Moussa Kousa has distanced himself from Gaddafi's regime in Tripoli, he has not called for the Libyan leader to resign. The opposition won't accept anything less than Gaddafi and his family's removal. A recent mediation by the African Union stopped short of calling on Colonel Gaddafi to step down. That too was met with skepticism by the TNC. And while this impasse continues, the body count from this war continues to rise. It's time, the opposition forces say, for the international community to step up to its promises. Sonia Gallego for Inside Story. Well, to discuss the Doha talks and the situation in Libya, I'm joined by three guests. In Paris, Nassif Hiti is the Arab League ambassador to Europe. In Oxford, Oliver Miles, a former British ambassador to Libya. And here in our studio in Doha, Wahid Boshan, a political strategist working with the Transitional Council on humanitarian issues. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. And let me inform you that uh, as we have been speaking in the past few minutes, the uh, group in Doha has issued a, a communique of their findings and their conversation today. Uh, and much of it you would expect. It's uh, nothing particularly new, but there are a couple of points that I want to highlight to you. Firstly, uh, they have agreed to set up a trust fund for the Libyan people. They're calling it a temporary financial mechanism to provide provide revenue for short-term requirements. It doesn't say what those requirements may be or how the money is to be spent, so that leaves open the option that it may be spent on armaments. Uh, and the other line that's worth mentioning is an apparently slightly harder line against Gaddafi himself. The group says the meeting is united in the belief that Gaddafi's continued presence would threaten any resolution to the crisis. So, Nassif Hiti, let me come to you first and, and ask you, do you think providing a temporary financial mechanism might make a difference? Well, this small firm position, as it started from Paris, then to London, then to Doha today, I think is important. It's extremely indicative of uh, the dangerous situation and the necessity uh, to apply at least the, the main important paragraph of resolution, Security Council Resolution 1973, which is an immediate ceasefire, ceasefire to impose an immediate ceasefire, to reach a ceasefire, 
and an end to acts of violence perpetrated against the civilian population. It's a very important to have a very strong message, very strong message by all influential actors, whether Arab well, actors, Well, the contact group also African did actors, mention European the, international actors the contact on this group matter. did reaffirm uh, their allegiance to 1973 uh, and uh, the, the, the contents of that. But what I want to ask you is, do you think setting up a financial mechanism to provide funds to the rebels is a good idea? Well, that's an important idea. It's a very necessary idea. It's a timely idea uh, to uh, provide support uh, for the rebels. But let me go a step further and say we must first and foremost, regardless of this idea, which is important, as I said, put an end, just put an end to this carnage that's happening against the Libyan population All right, well, and start engaging in a dialogue for the, for the people of Libya to decide uh, what is the end of uh, this uh, issue, of how course, to come out of this crisis and how to find reform necessary reforms and legitimate demands and every, everybody everybody engaged months. in this conversation at all levels has made those same points as you have the problem here is not necessarily that anyone doesn't share your sentiments it's how to actually make that happen is what this contact group has been uh, here to discuss L let me come to you Oliver Miles uh, what do you think about what has been said so far and is have you heard anything that might actually change this dynamic well, what you've told me is encouraging, and what the Arab League ambassador has said is encouraging, because I think uh, the Arab League are probably in a better position to take, uh, take a stand than the international community is. Uh, it would be good to see the, the Arab League playing an active part, and also the um, African Union. But I don't have very high expectations of this meeting in Doha myself. I think uh, what, they've, what you've said about the financial um, arrangements makes very good sense probably necessary. We know that Qatar has already played an important part in, in facilitating oil sales from the eastern part of Libya, which is under the control of the, of the rebels. Uh, that's good. Um, we also heard today from the Minister of Finance, that is from the Gaddafi side, from Abdulhafid Zlitni, that uh, it seems that uh, money pressures may be beginning to be felt on, uh, in, in that area as well, and we should do everything we can to increase those pressures. But there's not much you can expect from the contact group, I don't think. Increasing pressures, uh, Wahid Boshan, is that necessarily uh, something that anyone is going to respond to at this stage? What we've seen so far is the two sides fighting themselves into what seems to be pretty much a stalemate uh, and no real sense that either of them is interested in having a conversation or perhaps stopping at, at a point that would allow dialogue to go ahead. Well, I, I would say um, from the, the Consul's perspective, I think these things are in the right direction. I, I've been in Benghazi, I, I've, uh, I've been in some of their meetings, and uh, uh, I understand fully the, the need for uh, funding and the need for uh, support and legitimacy for that matter. Um, I think from, from that perspective, uh, they themselves um, have already uh, uh, moving in the right direction uh, in all aspects, but they needed the support of the international community. I think this is another level of support that is required. And to the point of the Arab ambassador, uh, that for the Libyan people at some point to decide, I, 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 I would say they have decided. They are looking beyond uh, this regime, and they're looking for ways to, for the international community to support them to do so. Nassif Hiti, let me come back to you. This idea of support being necessary is, is of course, at a diplomatic level, perfectly reasonable. But uh, again, I have to ask you, what we have seen thus far is absolutely no response from Colonel Gaddafi and no apparent um, effect of the continued pressure from the United States, from NATO, from the Europeans for him to stop. So how does another expression of support change anything? Well, as I said, uh, there are not uh, two different opposing or opposed to each other tracks. They are actually complementary tracks, providing all kinds of support, all kinds of support, and I stress all kinds of support to the Libyan people is extremely important as a must, as we say today before tomorrow. There is a sense of urgency that must be needed and, 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 and taken care of. That's on one hand, on one track. The second track is formulating a very strong, clear, the, in the clearest possible way, message to the Libyan regime that they must first and foremost reach a ceasefire, accept a ceasefire, a verifiable ceasefire, stop attacking the civilians. And when I go back to the idea of what the Libyan population decide or what the Libyan people decide, this has been entrusted and encrusted in the Security Council resolution. It is a process 
uh, later on of national reconciliation of rebuilding Libya and of course again and again we stress that it's for the Libyan people to decide on the finality and this is a process that we must also the international community all right the in your world, mind first and foremost the Africans everybody else must be supportive of that process must be supportive and backing entirely of that process in your mind how likely is a ceasefire to occur in the next few days weeks even Unfortunately, I'm not particularly optimistic about that, but let me go back to something we all knew from the beginning, and some didn't want to know from the beginning, that un there is no military solution to this problem. There is only a political solution, but to start dealing with a serious political solution that meet the demands, the legitimate demands of Libya's people, their right and, and, and legitimate demands, we must force a ceasefire. We must force a ceasefire, otherwise we'll be squaring circles, unfortunately. And this is why actors, international actors, states, powers that didn't come up forcefully right, well, with a position on that matter. Things are clearer today and they must act together in this way. Oliver Miles, can you describe a mechanism by which we can force a ceasefire? No, I don't think we can. I think uh, both sides would, would uh, be very suspicious indeed of a ceasefire at the moment uh, because for the rebels it would mean that uh, Gaddafi's forces would be left in able to dig in more closely around uh, centers of, of conflict like Misrata and for Gaddafi's side it would mean he'd be in an impossible position because the first thing that would happen would be a demonstration against him in the streets of Tripoli and he would either have to allow that demonstration to, to take place or he would have to start shooting people and I think I know which one he would choose. In the, in the current context of this conversation and this uh, suggestion that constant support is essential uh, for the process to move forward. What are we to make then uh, of the role of the African Union, whose support, it would appear, is much more on the side of Gaddafi than the rebels? Well, I was very disappointed with the African Union performance in uh, their attempt at mediation. It's a, uh, an absolute uh, requirement of mediation that you should begin by trying to understand the position of both sides. They didn't do that. As a matter of fact, President Zuma, who I suppose was the heavyweight member of the team and incidentally the only elected president among them, the other ones came to, to office by, by uh, coup d'etat, uh, President Zuma didn't even bother to go to Benghazi. He just listened to Gaddafi and then went. Well, so it's not very encouraging. It's, it's not indeed, and uh, uh, nothing seems to have come of it. And so we do again find ourselves in that stalemate situation. Wahid Boshan, uh, from your visit to Libya and from your position uh, as, a, as a Libyan and an observer, uh, how do you regard this conversation, these constant talks, these constant expressions of support, uh, and yet very little result? I, I think uh, Ambassador Oliver may, uh, pointed out something really important, and I think it's in the mind of a lot of people in Libya, is that the west uh, of Libya, the Tripoli, the capital, uh, they, 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 they need to be some movement on that. And I think the stalemate, the only, the only thing that would break the stalemate is to have uh, movement in the west side. And I think uh, uh, the, the council have recognized that, and I think the international community have recognized that, and I believe they're putting more resources, more focus on that. Once that happens and people start coming out and um, um, declaring, and have they, they, they have declared it uh, uh, many, many times, but I think in more consistent fashion, uh, I think it will it it, it, it will uh, create an environment um, uh, to to move forward out of the stalemate. Oliver Miles, on a practical, I mean, let's let's just put the cards on the table here and be entirely honest about the situation. At a tactical level, NATO's involvement and the involvement of the uh, Western powers has failed to make a difference. On a strategic level, uh, there appears to be no plan that is going to produce any better results. Uh, what is a way forward here? How, how is any of this talking doing anybody any good? Well, I think you slightly overstate the, the uh, failure of NATO. After all, uh, the, the intervention of NATO has destroyed a lot of tanks and heavy, heavy weaponry. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt, Ambassador, Gaddafi, Gaddafi but as we side. speak, Miserata is coming under continued heavy fire. There is talk amongst the agencies of a, a humanitarian crisis about to take place. Uh, the Gaddafi forces are apparently acting at will. All right. Well, I won't go on about uh, the, you know how we m we may have saved uh, lives in in Benghazi. We failed. That's true, and I think that was quite predictable. I think we went into this too quickly without working out uh, how what the end game was going to be. It was it was pretty clear, as a matter of fact, that uh, military intervention based on the Security Council resolutions was not going to solve the problem.
All right, Oliver Miles, uh, I'm afraid we are going to lose you at this point. Appreciate your contribution to the conversation. Oliver Miles, a former UK ambassador to Libya. Let me go to Nassif Hiti, the Arab League ambassador to Europe, and, uh, and put the question to you. A at a time when uh, Colonel Gaddafi's forces are causing what appears to be extensive damage and casualties in Misrata, uh, again, I just want to put to you the question of how is this going to stop? At what point is this going to stop, and what's the mechanism by which that will happen? Well, we were very much aware from day one, from the very beginning, that any military action or any international external action to put an end uh, and, and force a ceasefire on the Libyan regime uh, act uh, actions of violence against its own population cannot be, this is reality, unfortunately, I don't want to be sound cynical, cannot be divorced from the views of these different actors, international actors, regional and non-regional actors, about the situation in the region. So this is why some people thought at some point of time to proceed carefully, though the issue is extremely dangerous. And, and every time goes on, every time we feel that there are more casualties and, and, and the Libyan people are having and, uh, are, and, and suffering more and more. And that must come uh, to, to, to an end. Now, how to act, this is why I go back to what I said first. I think it's important to have an open-ended conference, an ongoing conference, a mechanism of almost day-to-day -day contacts today among key involved international actors. When I say key involved international actors, I do mean Arab, African, and other actors to seek a platform, an agreed-on platform, in order to send one single message on, first and foremost, the need to have a ceasefire. And when I say ceasefire, like my distinguished colleagues have mentioned before, it's not a ceasefire on one hand and the continuation of resorting to acts of violence against its own people in different cities on the other hand. A ceasefire would include everything as it has been indicated in the resolution itself in 1973. So it must have an integrated approach to that matter. I think more pressure is needed. A clearer message, when I say clearer message, a clearer message is a message that embodies more, more pressure, more direct pressure, political, diplomatic, economic, and other form of pressures to put an end to this really carnage carried by the regime against its own people. Well, it's interesting that you talk about consensus and the, and the need for it. Do you think that uh, your organization, the Arab League, uh, or any of the other Arab actors have been sufficiently united or determined in their approach to what's going on? Well, you know, we, we know very well in world politics, uh, a consensus is something that could be sometimes frail and it needs always to be, to be supported. And that kind of consensus, whether in the Arab League or elsewhere, in any kind of different regional or international organization, is supported by what I mentioned to uh, just a minute ago, ongoing negotiations and ongoing discussions and ongoing uh, dialogue among the concerned actors about how to best uh, you know, support and back that kind of, uh, of active uh, consensus. It's an active what is needed. It's not a passive consensus. It's not to say we want to see this happening and just we sit and wait. It's an active consensus to try to be involved, to be engaged much more actively and with that, that kind of backing up of a consensus. Wahid Bouchan, let me put the same question to you. What do you think about uh, the Arab countries, whether they be the Arab League, the GCC, or any other body, what do you think of their commitment to what's going on and uh, their unity and its effect on what's happening? Well, <clears throat> to compare them to uh, previous uh, issues that they had to deal with, I think this, this one, the Libyan issue, wasn't that bad. I mean, it was obviously from the Libyan perspective, it's not, uh, I mean, they needed more. But uh, we were surprised, I mean, how, how uh, uh, unanimous were uh, were on their decisions and and the GCC I think they're doing just fine but let me go back to the to the point uh, that was uh, earlier mentioned in terms um, what needs to be done to, to break this up well, can, I, can, I, can I just sure. stop you there Wahid for a moment because I just want to talk about this issue of consensus because it's unfair to talk about the Arab consensus without talking about uh, the other consensus we don't seem to have consensus in Europe and the international community either Britain and France now saying NATO is not doing enough Germany still uh, not even particularly uh, willing to get involved Turkey's uh, peace plan itself uh, raised some intriguing questions that uh, suggested uh, discontent amongst uh, some of the ranks as well what we have uh, is a bunch of people continuously talking each other and disagreeing with each other and then wondering why it's not leading us anyway, isn't it? Ab ab absolutely correct. But l let me add to that. I, I think it's, it's not so much the consensus, understanding what's going to happen and what they need to do. It is because their rivalry, there's other internal issues that they have among themselves that is impacting their decisions or their actions of that decisions to Libya. Right. And that's very unfortunate, of course. Nassif Hiti, let me ask for your opinion on the, the European aspect here, NATO uh, and the words of the UK 
and France recently that they're not doing enough. Everyone has always suggested that the 1973 resolution is very clear, and yet everyone seems to be interpreting it in different ways uh, and suggesting that perhaps not enough is being done. What are we to make of this? Well, everybody could stretch a bit his or her interpretation of the resolution to include something which is not clearly negated by the resolution. I mean, that's an open-ended thing in terms of interpretation, but there are things which are very clear. For instance, against uh, occupation, it's clear. No occupation of, of the Libyan territories, that's clear. And many other things are clear. Now, what could you infer? Uh, from the resolution remain to be you know decided here and there and it's open for debate but when i spoke about consensus i didn't mean only and exclusively consensus within the arab league i meant an interorganization let me put it this way interorganizational consensus among all the different groups of states whether arab league uh, african union e e eu and security council and other members to create a, a an active consensus based on ongoing debate on a sort of following up on a day-to-day -day basis of the crisis mm. to, to always enrich and maintain this consensus. And this cannot be done but by a kind of ongoing dialogue among all these actors. I mean, let's, let's be honest about it. All these actors also have to respond to different demands. They act in different environments where they have different priorities. If there is an agreement on this issue, we don't need to have an agreement as a matter of principle. We need to have an agreement as a policy on this issue, and not only as a matter of principle and just shelve it somewhere. And time is running out, and time is of essence because of what's happening to the Libyan people. This is why we need an, an ongoing discussion and a wide the widest possible kind of consensus that goes beyond the Arab world, beyond the African Union, beyond Europe, and to the international actors all concerned about putting an end to this crisis. And each of these actors could contribute its own way in trying to find a way to contribute to this consensus. To this working again and again, a working backed up consensus. All right, well, we'll have to wait and see if that actually happens. This, this Doha conference um, not going to be an ongoing one, from what I understand. Uh, but I suppose one thing that we can take some heart in. challenge. One thing that I think we can take heart in is, is the suggestion from this, consist that, uh, this conference rather, that a little bit of consensus is beginning to emerge about the role of Gaddafi himself after the African Union's peace plan, which didn't involve uh, mentioning him particularly. Uh, this conference has decided that Gaddafi's continued presence is a threat to the resolution of the crisis. So, uh, Waheed Boshan, let me come back to you. I mean, you asked earlier on what exactly the next step is going to be. Uh, outline for us what you think is going to happen next and whether this kind of... Uh, hardening of the attitude against Gaddafi might make a difference? Well, actually, uh, the, the point I just uh, just made as far as the consensus is an excellent one. And I think uh, uh, and, and the, the, the fact that the resolution is uh, has to be political, um, it's when the Gaddafi will realize that, uh, that, that, that that's it, he has to leave. And that realization, it's not going to come about with, um, with, uh, <laughs> with all the, uh, these entities not having that consensus. In any case, I think what's going to happen right now, unfortunately, unfortunately, is that uh, things have to change on the ground a little bit more in the favors of the Libyan people. Um, and, and I think uh, th that if that's not going to happen, if the things in the West are not going to happen, mm. uh, you know, it's going to, uh, he's not going to come to that point. Oh, I, th well. I think the focus has to be in the West at this point. One of, one of the, when you talk about things changing on the ground, one of the uh, issues that was discussed at this uh, Doha conference was the issue of possibly uh, arming the rebels. It's obviously not a new suggestion, but it's one that has been rejected consistently so far. And I believe it was rejected again at this Doha conference. Uh, Nassif Hiti, do you think that there will ever come a time when they might have to change their mind on this issue? Well, I think uh, it depends on the evolution of the situation uh, on, on the ground. But I'm sure certain states, certain groups of states, are already engaged in this, in this way, uh, in, in arming uh, rebels, are committed, are thinking of arming the rebels. This is why I go back and say, when I spoke about a consensus, I didn't mean just to have a conference standing there all the time and discussing the matter. I mean creating a mechanism of almost day-to-day -day consultation among the key actors on how to respond, how to react, or how to preempt certain actions that could happen and continue to send very strong, very strong message, all kinds of messages to the regime in order to stop the killing and right. accept, seriously accept a, a global uh, ceasefire that is a necessary sine qua non condition to proceed to change in Libya. Well, finally, Wahid Roshan, the same question to you. Is it time to arm these rebels? I, I believe so. Uh, no question about it. The Libyan people are asking for it. 
Um, and, uh, and I think it's the only w language that Gaddafi will understand. Um, unfortunately, if you, we've given him um, many, many options. I mean, political one, uh, you know, for, from a compassion uh, point of view, he didn't, he didn't uh, respond to any of that. And unfortunately, that's what he would respond to is, is you know, military action. All right, there we'll have to leave a gentleman, Wahid Bushan, here in Doha. Thank you for your contribution. In Paris, Nassif Hiti, Arab League ambassador to Europe. And we were joined earlier on from Oxford by Oliver Miles, a former British ambassador to Libya. That's it for today's program. Thank you also so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We always welcome your comments and suggestions. If you have any, email them to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. And that's it for this program. Goodbye for now.